Hi everybody, today we're going to talk about some aquatic biomes. So, aquatic biomes are classified as either freshwater or marine. Marine means saltwater. Um, and they are categorized by physical characteristics such as salinity. Salinity is saltiness. Depth, water flow. So is the water flowing quickly or slowly? Is it just sitting there stagnant? And also nutrient availability. And then similarly to terrestrial biomes, these biomes are classified by their plant life. So what plants can be supported in these different biomes? Um, so again, also similar to terrestrial biomes, these are not categorized based on animal life. They're also not categorized based on temperature, although temperature is really important because certain animals and plants can only survive in certain temperatures but that's not actually used to classify these different biomes. So 70% of Earth's surface is covered by water, 93% of that is salt water, and only 3% of that is fresh water. Um, less than 1% of that fresh water is actually accessible to humans for consumption. Most of it is locked away in glaciers. So if we're looking at this diagram on the bottom right, um, we have our small portion of fresh water pulled into this second graph. Um, ice and glaciers makes up the largest portion, and then we have groundwater, um, which humans can access, they can pump that out, um, and then we also have bodies of water and atmospheric water. So freshwater biomes consist of either streams or rivers. Streams are also referred to as creeks. Those are synonymous in the world of environmental science. And these are characterized by flowing fresh water that either originates from an underground spring or is runoff from rain or melting snow. So streams are narrow and they have generally small amounts of water. Rivers are much wider and they have large amounts of water. Um, it's sometimes difficult to differentiate whether something is a stream or a river. It's kind of, there's no strict cutoff. Streams generally have few plants and algae because the water flows fairly rapidly, whereas rivers are often, they have a slower water flow, which allows sediments to actually settle and support rooted plants. So we, can, we usually have more plants in rivers, um, but again, these two things are hard to differentiate sometimes. So rapids are turbulent stretches in streams or rivers. Turbulent means there's a lot of water movement. It's kind of, it's fast moving and it's maybe moving over lots of rocks. So it's getting kind of jumbled up. It's getting um, mixing with the air a lot. And that allows for a lot of oxygen to be dissolved into the water. So certain organisms um, need certain levels of oxygen. So um, organisms that need lots of oxygen are located near closer to the rapids, whereas organisms that can live with less oxygen or don't require as much oxygen may live in areas that do not have as many rapids or further away from those rapids. So lakes and ponds are another type of freshwater biome. They consist of standing water, so there's no river or stream, um, or they're different than a river or stream because it's just purely the standing water. Um, there's no clear point at which a pond becomes a lake. Ponds are generally smaller, but similarly to differentiating between streams and rivers, it can be difficult to decide what is a pond and what is a lake. Generally, lakes are larger standing water, larger bodies of standing water. Then um, lakes in particular have these different zones. So we have the littoral zone, which is the shallow area of soil and water near the shore. So it can be confusing. Often people think the littoral zone is the whole top surface of the water, but it's not. The littoral zone is just the edge of the lake um, where plants are supported. So most photosynthesis occurs in this zone, so you should make note of that. Most photosynthesis occurs here. And that's because we have enough sediment, um, enough actual area for plants to create roots and actually settle and grow. So we get lots of photosynthesis occurring in that area. Um, this is also because we've got algae in that area. So um, important characteristic of the littoral zone to know. Then the limnetic zone is where rooted plants cannot survive. 
So the limnetic is kind of the center area of our lake or pond, so it does not consist of any of these sediments. This is not limnetic. Limnetic is just the open water, um, but it is as deep as sunlight can penetrate. So that means we can get sunlight. And so what we do get in this region is phytoplankton. And phytoplankton is floating algae. These are the only photosynthetic organisms. So the only organisms that do photosynthesis in this area because we can't support any rooted plants. Then the next zone is called the profundal zone. This is the region where there is no sunlight. So sunlight cannot make it to this lower area. Um, there's no plants, no algae, no photosynthesis occurring. So there's insufficient oxygen to su support many larger organisms. So only organisms that really don't need that much oxygen can survive in the profundal zone. And then the lowest zone is our benthic zone. And this is just the muddy bottom region. So this is all the sediments at the bottom. Here, let me clear this diagram a little bit so you can see better. So the benthic zone is this sediment region at the bottom of the lake. So um, sometimes it's easy to get the profundal and benthic zones com um, confused. Profundal is the open water portion, benthic is the portion with sediments. So then lakes are also classified by their levels of fertility. So that means, fertility means how many nutrients? How much or how many nutrients? And we specifically look at nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, so in an oligotrophic lake, this is a lake with low levels of nutrients. And it's really clear. So when we're thinking oligotrophic, we're thinking lakes like Lake Tahoe, where you can see pretty far into the water. It's pretty clear. It's lots of clarity. Um, a mesotrophic lake is a lake with moderate nutrient levels. So that's like Berryessa, if you go there. Um, and then a eutrophic lake is a lake that has high fertility, so lots of nutrients, and it's turbid. Basically, turbid means that there's um, lots of particles in the water, so it's difficult to see through. So it's not clear in those types of lakes. Um, more lakes are becoming eutrophic because we have so much human activity and because humans add a lot of nutrients. Um, this is because you're bringing in things like chemicals, if you're wearing sunscreens or other chemicals that are released into the um, lakes based on human activities. We also are using a lot more fertilizers. So if that fertilizer runs off into a lake, that can add more nutrients and also run off from urban areas, just like cities and other things can bring lots more nutrients into these lakes and cause um, them to become closer to eutrophic or mesotrophic. So our last freshwater biome to talk about is a wetland. Wetlands are include things like swamps, marshes, and bogs. Basically, they are submerged or saturated with water for at least part of the year. So that means um, the whole area is covered in water for most of the year, or at least part of the year, a good portion of it. Um, wetlands are really important because they reduce the severity of floods and droughts. They also support a very specific very specific types of organisms, so they have a lot of biodiversity in these regions, and these wetlands can filter pollutants. So since they support lots of plants, when they fill up with water, that water may carry pollutants. Those plants can help to filter them out of the water. So the Laguna de Santa Rosa is the largest freshwater wetlands complex on the northern California coast, so that's cool. It's local. Um, interesting to know. So our first marine biome is called an estuary, and this is an area where we get fresh water from rivers mixing with salt water from the ocean. So this Estero Americano is one example of an estuary local to us. So it's between Dillon and Doran Beach, if you go out to the coast ever. Um, rivers carry a lot of nutrient-rich organic material, and that leads to estuaries being highly productive. So as we get this river water mixing with ocean water, we have this water that's rich in nutrients. So we can support lots of plant and algae growth and plants and algae do photosynthesis, which indicates that they are productive, highly productive. So when we talk about primary productivity, primary productivity, 
we're talking about photosynthesis. So when we say an area is highly productive, that means we have lots of plants or organisms that do photosynthesis. Um, these estuaries also provide some unique habitats um, and some, can support some specific organisms. Um, this estuary in particular, it contains lots of eelgrass, which is an important underwater plant, and it helps to filter the water and provide food and habitat to many species. Our next marine biome is the mangrove swamps. So these swamps um, are really important. They contain trees that are salt tolerant, so things like mangroves, um, and they have submerged roots. So these trees are really interesting because they've got their like major trunk structures, and then the rest of their roots are partially submerged or sometimes fully submerged. Um, but these swamps are really important because they protect shorelines from storms and erosion. So if we have a lot of wave action that's coming in, so say we've got, let's see if I can draw this, like lots of water movement coming towards these roots, the roots can kind of help to break apart those waves so that they like disperse the energy so that it's not all hitting our shoreline and eroding away that shoreline. So these are super important. And they also provide habitats for fish and shellfish. They shelter them from predators, um, especially little baby fish. Once they're freshly hatched, um, they will often live within these roots for a while or like between the roots for a while um, to be protected from predators. What's unfortunate is that nearly one third of the world's mangrove swamps have been destroyed and they've been destroyed to make room for homes or spaces for crops, especially crops like rice. So another marine biome that we need to talk about is the intertidal zone. So this one is very specific and has some very interesting conditions that organisms have to put up with. Um, but intertidal zone is a narrow band of coastline that exists between high and low tides. So if you've ever been tide pooling, you're going to the intertidal zones. Um, these conditions on the intertidal zone can be pretty harsh. So during high tide, it's not too bad. We get some waves coming in and crashing against the surface of rocks and the organisms need to deal with that. Um, but in general, they can um, survive pretty, pretty easily when we're in high tide. When low tide comes around, that's when these organisms have to put up with things like direct sunlight, they have to put up with high temperatures, desiccation, which means drying out, and then also um, heavy wave action. So organisms have some pretty unique adaptations in order to survive in these areas. Um, a lot of things like chitons and limpets, they will just suction themselves really quickly to the surface of a rock, so they will keep themselves from drying out, from becoming desiccated and losing their water. We have things like mussels that can close themselves in really tightly to um, keep any water from escaping. Um, and many other organisms have similar adaptations like that. Another marine biome is the coral reef. So corals are actually small animals. It's a common misconception that corals are a type of plant, but they're small animals. And what they do is they form an external skeleton or an exoskeleton that's made of limestone. That's this, um, oops, sorry, it's calcium carbonate. We're gonna talk about next video in the carbon cycle, but calcium carbonate is CaCO3. Um, it's formed by calcium ions combining with carbon dioxide in the ocean. Um, so corals will take in carbon dioxide and calcium to form calcium carbonate. And corals have this really cool mutualistic relationship with a specific algae called zooxanthellae. Um, corals release carbon dioxide and nutrients. They provide a, habit, a habitat for these algae. And algae provide the corals with sugar and oxygen. Some major threats to coral reefs include pollutants, um, sediments that block out sunlight. So if we don't have enough sunlight in these coral reef areas, the algae cannot perform photosynthesis and then these coral reefs suffer. So coral reefs are that mutualistic relationship between algae and corals. And then coral bleaching. And coral bleaching is caused by rising temperatures, so rising ocean temperatures, or ocean warming, you could say. But basically, these coral and algae depend on each other to survive. And algae, these zooxanthellae, are very um, temperamental when it comes to temperature. So if the ocean warms even 1 to 2 degrees Celsius, which isn't um, a huge amount, um, 
I mean, it is in the context of the ocean. But even if the ocean rises one to two degrees Celsius, the algae becomes stressed and they'll actually leave the coral. They're, they'll either die if the temperature rises too quickly or they will move to another location where the ocean isn't as warm. What happens is the, the corals lose this color because algae provides a lot of color to these corals. Um, and so the coral is left just with their calcium carbonate skeleton and without the source of sugar and without the oxygen that that algae provided, the corals will then die. And our last marine biome that we're gonna talk about today is the open ocean. This is also divided into zones. So even though the, the ocean is huge, we have some different zones in here. The first one is the photic zone, and this is the area that receives enough sunlight for photosynthesis. Um, primarily in the ocean, we have phytoplankton producing um, oxygen and carbon dioxide by performing photosynthesis. So um, phytoplankton are kind of the basis of these oceanic food webs. And phytoplankton survive in the photic zone where they can perform photosynthesis. The aphotic zone is the area of the open ocean that does not receive sunlight. So it doesn't receive, even though this diagram doesn't look very dark, um, we've got no sunlight coming down here, so no photosynthesis occurring. So we've got much less oxygen content in this area. And then at the very bottom, similar to a lake, the benthic zone is the ocean floor, the sediments, the sand at the bottom of the ocean. And then for your practice FRQ for this section, I want you to identify an organism that is found in an aquatic biome. So this could be freshwater or marine. And then I want you to explain how that organism is uniquely adapted to live in that biome. So your organism can be a plant, it can be an animal, um, some living thing found in an aquatic biome, and how is it uniquely adapted to live there.